So <clears throat> you've unpacked this a few times, but there's a lot of uh, reported benefit to polyunsaturated fats um, creating or allowing for uh, insulin sensitivity in a fat cell. Whereas your argument sure. is, okay. is saturated fat allows for some insulin resistance, which is beneficial for hyperplasia versus hypertrophy in fat yes. cells. Yes. Would you mind just for the hundredth time unpacking that? Yeah, that's a very complex question um, for people, so I'll, I'll back up so people understand it. So, okay. um, I believe that insulin resistance begins in the adipocyte, begins in the fat cell. And the way the fat cells become appear to become broken is that they lose the capacity to divide. So there's hypertrophy and hyperplasia. And I always get the two mixed up. So one of them is the growth of the fat cell, ballooning, and one of them is the actual division of the fat cell into more fat cells. So fat cells that balloon and don't divide are problematic. That is when fat cells become diseased. That's clearly associated with an insulin-resistant phenotype. They start to spew inflammatory mediators, cytokines, and free fatty acids, which signal to the rest of the body that you want to become insulin-resistant, but that's pathology. So a fat cell that cannot divide appears to be the root or one of the proximate steps of insulin-resistant metabolic dysfunction. So the question is, how does that happen? How does the fat cell get to the point that it can't divide, that it gets stuck and it's balloons and balloons and balloons, like the guy in my python who puts a little thing on his tongue and then just explodes, right? The Mr. Fat Guy, I forget his name. Somebody might remember that guy. Does anybody Mr. Mr. Creosol. Mr. Who? Creosol. Mr. Creosol? Yeah. All right, so that's the character in Monty Python where he just puts this little thing super the, fat, and like this one little thing goes and he just explodes. The, the wafer like, thin mint. It was a thin mint, yes, mm -hmm. on his tongue and he yes. explodes. Um, so, how does the fat cell get like that? Well. There's good evidence that the breakdown products of linoleic acid are associated with that phenotype in the fat cell. These are things like 4-HNE, 13-HODE, or 13 ho And so linoleic acid is polyunsaturated fat. So we see, okay, the breakdown products of linoleic acid are associated with that pathological phenotype. That doesn't look good for linoleic acid. And then you learn that fats like linoleic acid actually allow the fat cell to be insulin sensitive, which sounds like a good thing until you realize that insulin sensitivity in a fat cell makes the fat cell grow. Because what happens when insulin, something is insulin sensitive, it grows. Insulin is not necessarily anabolic, it's anti-catabolic. So when a fat cell is insulin sensitive, the fat cell is not going to be able to stop growing. It's just gonna, it's not gonna be able to like shrink or become, you know, it's like it's not gonna be able to deplete its size. It's not gonna be able to like open the drain of the gate. People think about like a bathtub, right? Insulin doesn't necessarily fill the bathtub with water, but it plugs the drain so nothing else can come out. So when you eat, you have fat, you have carbohydrates, you have nutrients that are going to go into cells in your body, they're gonna go into fat cells. And if the fat cell, the hypothesis is that if fat cells are inappropriately insulin sensitive, they just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And then it's a balance, right? Because maybe you have a donut and your fat cells become a little insulin sensitive and then you eat you know, organs and meat and things go back. But if you're constantly doing this thing where you're eating seed oils because they're good for you, quote unquote, and they lower your LDL, and everybody knows canola oil is amazing, your cardiologist told you it's good for you, and everybody knows that saturated fat causes insulin resistance in the fat cell, which are, you know, which isn't a good thing, right? Everybody knows saturated fat causes heart disease, and obviously being facetious with all of this. Then if you continue to do that, at some point your fat cells are probably gonna pass the point of no return and become a little broken, and that seems to be what happens. So it is true that the level of fat cell, the, the saturated fat does appear to cause insulin resistance, but that's probably a good thing because it, means it doesn't grow, right? It doesn't, it doesn't grow, it shrinks. But this is widely misinterpreted and widely confused by vegans are saying, look, saturated fat clearly causes diabetes. Well, we have so many fucking diabetics here, you know? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good thing nobody, you know, I see guys are all eating so much saturated fat. Clearly not. So I think that it's an overly simplistic argument that is a really cursory, minimal, high-level understanding that's really just completely wrong. So at the level of the fat cell, the way you keep it healthy, I think, is with animal fats and minimal amounts of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Of course, there's some in animal fat and not excess monounsaturated fat either. And the way you disease, the way you develop disease is you get evolutionarily inappropriate levels of linoleic acid, potentially. It's complex. Again, the breakdown products of linoleic acid, 4-HNE, 13-HODE, are, are associated with all these problems. So it looks to be problematic, it looks to be guilty, but it could just be an inflammatory phenotype or some sort of oxidative stress that's oxidizing linoleic acid that's already in the membrane. But you can pretty much find evidence for every step of the way along the path. Like if you eat more linoleic acid, you get more linoleic acid in your cell membranes, okay? That we know. If you have more linoleic acid in your cell membranes, you get more HNE, okay? 
If you have more H and E, you have more oxidative stress. Okay. If you have more H and E, you have more oxidized LDL. Okay. If you have more H and E, you have more diseased fat cells. Okay. So it's like A goes to B goes to C goes to D. It's pretty much every step of the way. You can draw the story and say, yep, there's evidence for every piece of the puzzle. It's just that people don't see it all together, and they can't imagine that something that lowers LDL could be bad for you. This is why the LDL thing is like the major uh, crush or the major, I think, stumbling block for people because they're going to say, no, anything that lowers ApoB must be good for humans. And when you release, when you release the demons, when you exercise the fucking demons, of LDL, and you realize, oh, holy shit, maybe LDL isn't the end all be all. Maybe rising LDL with such a fact isn't the end of the world. Then you start to, it all starts to make sense because it all has to be this sort of evolutionarily consistent story in my mind. Like, why would something that is in animal food, that is also nutrient rich, that our ancestors see be bad for us? Oh, it's actually not bad for us, like we're being told. So, when that all makes sense to me, if we believe saturated fat is bad for us, then we have, I have a really hard time understanding any evolutionary story and anthropology and human seeking of meat and like, oh, we're just seeking things that are killing us? Like, humans are thriving and being more fertile and having more babies and growing taller and like being much healthier but also dying from this thing? It doesn't make any sense to me. So it all has to kind of make sense uh, because that's, presumably that's how, you know, millions of years of natural evolution would work for us as humans. So 